Here are some quick notes on dynamical time to accompany chapter two of To Build a Star. Okay, so let's start by considering the free fall time. So hydrostatic equilibrium, that's what describes the stable state of our star. That's pressure balancing gravity. So if you remove pressure, what's the time scale for this thing to kind of collapse? What's the time scale for, for some chunk of matter to fall inwards? So the equation of motion is going to be set up much the way you set up uh, Kepler's third law. So you have the centripetal force for this bulk of matter kind of orbiting the center of the star has to be equal to the force of gravity. So we write our centripetal force and our gravitational force in the usual ways. We can cancel some uh, powers of mass or cancel the little mass here. So we don't care how much this little fluid element weighs and we can cancel one power of radius and we get this relation here. Okay. So the velocity that our object is moving, this is going to be the length of the orbit divided by the orbit period. Okay. So we can, what we're going to do here is instead of thinking of uh, a circular orbit, like you usually do starting out with Kepler's law, even though it's valid for elliptical orbits, um, you can basically stretch this ellipse to kind of an extreme sort of ridiculous point, right? So it's basically just a straight line. So then your orbit length is two times some radius divided by the period. And the period itself, this is two times the free fall time, right? Because you're falling in and coming back out. Okay. So the free fall time squared is equal to the radius cubed divided by Newton's gravitation constant times the mass that is encompassed in within this radius r. Now here's the trick. Keep in mind that your ellipse is stretched, right? So the radius we're referring to is the radius in this picture, capital R, uh, divided by two. So our initial circle, right, has some radius r, but when you uh, move the focus to the extreme edge of the ellipse here, right, you do this flat, really flatten this circle out, then effectively the radius that we're talking about is that big r divided by two, right? Because this is kind of the center of your squashed circle, and so you're using capital R over two in the picture. So then the free fall time squared is this radius actually of the star uh, cubed divided by eight times uh, gravitation constant times the mass, okay? So now uh, let's just recall that the average density, right? You just take the mass divided by the volume, and so you can get a relationship for the radius cubed divided by the mass that we can plug into the free fall time. And when we do that, we get that the free fall time, right, is equal to some constant here times one over the square root of Newton's big G times the average density. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. So now let's consider the time scale for motion due to pressure, right? So if our star begins to collapse, there's gonna be a response in terms of an outgoing pressure wave, and that's gonna move at the sound speed. So to get this sound speed, let's consider our fluid element moving through some area. So we have some area A and fluids moving upward in this direction. And the reason it's moving um, is because there's gonna be a difference in uh, the forces here. So that's gonna cause an acceleration. So we have pressure uh, on the bottom and on the top, and that pressure difference is going to create a uh, force that gives us an acceleration. So our net force, right, is gonna be equal to a mass times an acceleration. That net force is essentially the area times the difference in pressure here. And so then we can relate the pressure difference to our acceleration, our change in velocity. Okay, so that uh, pressure difference here, we're just doing some algebra, we're moving area over to the other side. And then there's a trick, right? Uh, we can multiply both sides times the length of this fluid element, or the height of it, I guess, in this picture. And so then the change in pressure over that height, which is dp dz, is equal to the mass over the area times the height, which is equal to the mass over the volume, which is equal to the density. So we have dp dz is minus density times the acceleration, the change in velocity. And we're physicists, so we'll do that awful thing with derivatives where we'll just go ahead and take the dz and pop it over to the other side. And 
as you'll see in a moment, will also kick dv off to the side and promote dz up above dt. So we have the change in pressure is equal to minus the density times the change in velocity times what we'll see here is also the velocity. Okay, so as a quick detour, um, consider that we have conservation of mass. So the amount of mass we have flowing into the fluid, this, this sort of area here is gonna be equal to the, the amount of mass flowing out. It's kind of like water flowing through a hose, right? The hose isn't getting any heavier. So the amount of water you put in has to be equal to the amount that comes out. So that means that the density of the fluid times the area times the velocity is constant. Here we're just considering a fixed area for this, this hose, if you will. So the density times the velocity is constant. So what does that mean? That means that the, the change in the product is equal to zero, right? It's constant. So d rho v is zero. And when you do something like this, you can break it out into the partial derivatives. So d rho v is equal to v d rho plus rho dv. Again, those are equal to zero. So that means that v d rho is equal to minus rho dv. And why did we do that? It's so that we can substitute instead of minus rho dv that we had in this pressure equation, we can pop the v d rho, velocity times change in density. Because we're trying to relate our pressure and density here ultimately. So returning to the pressure gradient, we can do that substitution. This change in pressure is equal to velocity times change in density times something that we can recognize here as the velocity. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then you see that the change in pressure is the velocity squared times the change in density. So then the velocity of our pressure wave here is the square root of the derivative of the pressure with respect to density. And for an ideal gas, we have that the pressure is proportional to the density uh, times the temperature. And so uh, dp d rho is just the pressure over the density itself, right? So the speed of our pressure wave is roughly the square root of the pressure divided by the density. Now that is the solution that Newton had. Uh, later on, Laplace realized that the problem here is that this process, this, this perturbation process is not isothermal, so the temperature can change. It's isentropic. And so it turns out you need to add this correction from Laplace here. You multiply the pressure times the adiabatic constant gamma. And so our sound speed is equal to the square root of the adiabatic constant times the pressure divided by the density. Now we can go ahead and solve for the sound crossing time. So this is equal to the, the dimension of our object or the radius of the star divided by the sound speed. So we can go ahead and plug in this relation for the sound speed. We get radius times square root of density over gamma times pressure. And then what you um, can do here, at least if you want to get the rough scaling, you know, take the solution from hydrostatic equilibrium for a constant density star. We're just going to make that substitution here, assume it's constant density star. You do this in one of the exercises. It's, it's relatively straightforward to figure out this density and this pressure. And then when you plug those in, you see that the sound crossing time is roughly one over the square root of Newton's gravitational constant times the average density. That's interesting, right? Because you see that our free fall time, this was proportional to one over the square root of G times the average density. So was the sound crossing time. So we call this physical uh, uh, dimension here, we call this the dynamical time. So that is just defined as one over the square root of g times the average density. So this is essentially how long does it take for structural changes in our star to propagate, right? And it gives you a rough time scale for what's fast versus what's slow. So if you're a lot quicker than the dynamical time, that's very quick. Something that's a lot slower than the, the dynamical time is very slow. And if you plug in the numbers for the sun, you get about an hour. Okay, so anything quicker than an hour is fast. Anything slower than an hour is slow. Okay, so for a star, you see that the free fall time is on the order of the sound crossing time. Okay, and that is why our star is able to maintain equilibrium. So the time for some kind of action to happen, like a collapse, uh, is roughly the same as the time for the response, this pressure wave uh, time, this sound crossing time. So that that's basically how our star is balanced, is the fact that if there's a little bit of a collapse inward, the 
uh, pressure wave that's responding responds quick enough, you know, on the order of the same time as the collapse to counteract it. And that's how it can maintain some sort of balance. Now, this is true when you have your adiabatic constant as 5 thirds, like an ideal gas. But as you saw, these are basically on the same order. It's, it's a very delicate balance. And as we'll see in a little bit when we do a, um, basically a more sophisticated derivation, that if your adiabatic constant is a little bit lower, then you will get a collapse. And that is it for these quick notes on the dynamical time.